Um, so uh, if you're not familiar, um, so Mapbox is, uh, as was mentioned, the location services platform, but uh, that boils down into these four general categories. So there's maps and map rendering. Um, so not just mapping of your own data, but the entire like global base map of you know street names and closures, speed limits, all that sort of stuff, uh, points of interest. Um, all of that takes a massive amount of data pipelines to build and create. Um, and you can just you know quickly get a, a map of the world um, with your relevant information on it for your relevant area uh, in whatever platform you want uh, and make it look beautiful and, and uh, perform it. Um, search is also really important. So when you start typing in an address and you get an autocomplete response of like, you know, one, two, three Sesame Street, um, we have to have a global database of every address on the, on the planet and we have to keep it up to date with like literally thousands of updates, uh, you know, probably per hour. Um, and then there's also navigation. So uh, you know, open up your app and set in a destination and have it actually guide you and check where you are with your GPS and, and reroute you and that sort of thing. Um, so we offer APIs for that as well. And then data, um, we actually have data products uh, because we collect so much uh, you know, information from uh, end users about you know, traffic speeds. Uh, all of it is anonymized, of course, but you can, uh, you can get movement data products for any uh, major city in the world. Um, you can get uh, real-time traffic and that sort of thing. So we also offer data products. Um, so just to give you kind of an idea of the types of APIs and SDKs that we have uh, to support all of the, the, the subject areas that I just described. Um, so, you know, map search navigation. Uh, we also have, uh, you know, for, for the, on the client side, we have, um, you know, mobile. Uh, so Android, iOS, and uh, JavaScript packages. Uh, and then all of those are supported in all the major frameworks. So you have a lot of people building with Flutter uh, on the mobile side. And you have a lot of people building with like React Native. Um, you know, obviously uh, Vue and and uh, React. Um, so pretty much whatever whatever tool you want to build uh, front end experiences in, we've got a map SDK to support it. Um, so about me, um, in the past I've been a civic hacker. Uh, I worked for I, I say in here uh, re recovering government employee. So that was my um, my time spent in New York City government. Uh, I'm an urban planner by training, uh, but ended up in the technology and data world, um, you know, shortly after finishing planning school. So had a pretty interesting career and I'm really happy to be at Mapbox today, which is a company that uh, whose products I've used for a very long time. So um, I'm, I'm also very excited to share like the developer portal because uh, it's one that I've actually used quite a bit. So uh, let me stop the slideshow real quick and we'll move over to the Mapbox docs. Um, and yeah, so this is our docs site, and I uh, I am I am tasked with uh, with maintenance of the the platform behind this. Most of the content is created by our product teams. Um, but if you didn't already get it from kind of the earlier slides I showed, we have a lot of products. So if you just scrolling down this page, you'll see there's lots of tiles, um, and they're divided into these sections. So maps, navigation, search, and data. Um, each of them has SDKs, APIs, and each of them has their own documentation site. And most of these have, many of them have many pages on their own. Um, give you an idea of, you know, once you get past the actual product documentation, uh, we have this section called help and support. Um, so this is all the, the documentation that's a little more general about, uh, you know, getting started with the platform, tutorials, how-to videos, troubleshooting guides, and, and uh, a, a glossary, which is just actually kind of every every obscure term you've ever come across when you're doing map building or, or working with any of our products will be up in the glossary and just gives you some uh, some great you know place to, to define things. Um, and then we also have a whole slew of other resources. So lots of cards on here. Um, before I jump in and show you some of the stuff we do to help people get onboarded quickly, uh, I'll share another example um, of how we you know, can demystify this uh, with a developer cheat sheet. So um, if, you know, if all those cards on the page were kind of daunting, uh, here they are, which is, you know, might, might be equally daunting to some people, but uh, this one, this interface actually makes it a little fun. So um, I actually got this idea by when I saw a, um, there, there's a Google Cloud Platform developer cheat sheet that someone built. And when you hover over each one of these services, it kind of tells you, you know, in as few words as possible what it does. Um, so I thought, I thought with, a, with a company that has this many tools and this many services and APIs, this would be a really great way to um, kind of put them all into a kind of a smaller, more compact uh, user interface and let you kind of play around and explore. So you can also uh, open up a full, uh, all the cards for a specific uh, section and explore. And then when you click on these, it'll actually take you to the API docs. So for example, 
if I say, what is the isochrone API? Well, it calculates travel time areas. And I click on that, and I end up on the docs for the isochrone API. Um, so I'll come back to this in a moment, because isochrones are really fun. If you don't know what they are, um, we have a playground, uh, which I would love to show you. That also helps people get onboarded very quickly. Um, but I'm going to start with kind of our most, our most well-known um, developer resource. Uh, it's, it's a web developer resource for people who are building web maps. Um, but let's go to the Maps section, and let's go to Mapbox GLJS. So this is our JavaScript library for, for building maps. And um, if you're not familiar with it, you know it's, it's similar to the same type of interface you would expect from digital maps, where you can kind of drag around, and you have this interactive view. Uh, we also have a great globe view. Um, but how do you get started with these? So if you click over here on the Examples section, you will see we have a plethora of examples. There's, I think there's over 130 examples in here. And they range from the most basic of just display a map with nothing on it other than the base map or the you know the the you know in contextual information for any given area um, to clustering to adding your own data with uh, you know with polygons and points to adding 3D models to um, you know drawing uh, markers with custom uh, custom images in them. So each one of these, and I'll click on this one because this is kind of one of the most basic that people start with. So. Very uh, typical use case uh, for, for kind of beginners who are using uh, our, our JavaScript library will be to make um, a map that shows a pin on it where a business is located, for example. Um, and these examples are great because not only are they a, a working interactive web map because we're, you know all the docs are on the web, um, you can actually scroll down and get fully functional uh, HTML, JavaScript, and CSS code that you can literally copy and paste and start running in a local server. Um, so of course, this is vanilla JavaScript. It has nothing to do with uh, with uh, you know React or Vue or or whatever um, framework you might be using. But it's a really great learning tool because it kind of removes all that uh, all the cruft of the frameworks and all the overhead there, and gives you just kind of you know very direct. Here are the here are the twenty or thirty lines of code necessary to do this. Um, another benefit that's really neat here is that uh, if you are logged in, uh, we actually give. We actually inject your access token, your, your think of it as your API key, uh, into the example. So when you copy this code, uh, you know we don't have to keep track of like a, a default API key that will get spread all over the world. Um, but it's actually your own API key, so we can track that usage to you. And uh, if you actually end up using this code in product, you know somewhere else when you start building your tools, uh, your code is already injected there. Um, so for example, uh, another really interesting feature of this is. Uh, if you wanted to tinker with this, you know, instead of copy, you can copy and paste the code just by clicking copy. Um, but you also have these kind of uh, quick buttons that'll take this code and throw it into JS Fiddle and CodePen, so you can start tinkering with it. So I'm going to give you a quick example of that. But if I click Edit in CodePen, it's going to take that code, drop it into a CodePen using their API, um, and now I can actually edit the code. So for example, um, if you look at this JavaScript code, it's actually creating two markers. Um, so First thing I want to do is get rid of the, the second marker. So I'm just going to delete it. And let's let that run. And now I've got one marker. And then I'm going to show you how I can just change the coordinates of that marker. Um, before, I need, before I do that, I need the coordinates of a place that I want to uh, show. So I'm going to show you another Mapbox developer tool called the Location Helper. Um, so my team, uh, in, in addition to supporting the docs, gets to work on these kinds of front end applications uh, that actually are helpful to the developers. So, you know, if you're a developer making maps, you often need to get center points uh, in latitude and longitude coordinates. You also need to get zoom levels. If you're not familiar with map zoom levels, you can see the zoom, you know, goes up as I zoom in. Uh, and you also need to get bounding boxes, which are basically coordinates that describe uh, uh, not quadrangles, but uh, basically the north, the northern, you know, the the corners of a, a geographic area. Um, but say, for example, I want to put a point here in New York or a marker here in New York. I can move the crosshairs over here and then just copy the center point. I'll go back to my code pen and I'm going to change out uh, this array, which is the center point for where the map is going to uh, to load, and this point, which is where the marker will be drawn. And you'll see it's reloading here in a second. But here's my marker in New York. Um, so again, very rudimentary example, but you can see how uh, I went from uh, the you know the documentation site, which had this great code example, directly into a sandbox environment in CodePen. Uh, and then, you know, if you can imagine with me for a moment, I can now take this and drop it into, you know, whatever environment I'm actually building in and start working very quickly. So that's a fun um, user onboarding experience uh, that's made possible with our docs. Um, so let's go back to the docs for a moment. Let's see, where did I leave the docs? 
Okay, they're in here somewhere. Okay, um, so another one I want to draw your attention to is playgrounds. Um, so anywhere you see an API, not anywhere, but many of them, uh, you'll see API playground here uh, next to the docs. So uh, probably the simplest one to, to show right now is going to be the directions API. So let's go down to the navigation section. And the directions API, uh, as you would expect, is just an API that you can pass in an origin and a destination, and it will do all the routing for you. So it has a, you know, internally it has a map of the world, uh, the same one we use to visualize, um, you know, the the and display the map, but it will also do routing for you. So it knows I can take the best route by turning here and then turning here. Uh, it'll give that back to you in a JSON response. Um, if you look at the API docs, you know, you might be immediately intimidated by scrolling down here to saying, oh, I have to retrieve directions. I have to figure out a routing profile. I have to pass in coordinates. I don't know which coordinates I have. Um, so you know, we give you, the, we give you the, the structure of this API call, but a playground really makes it much simpler because it, it wraps all, or it presents a user interface that, that help you build that API call. So let's click on directions API playground. Um, so some people might want to go through and read the docs in detail, but if you want to get started quickly, this is the way to do it. And um, you know, basically, it's a user experience. It's a user interface that's built around crafting API calls, and you can see that this API URL down here still has placeholders in it. But as soon as I start interacting, so let's say I'm in uh, New York, New York, which is where I am right now, and I want to drive to um, Boston, which is far away. But let's see what happens. So I'm in the driving profile, and um, basically, what this has done is created a API call for me, so I can actually copy this and get started very quickly with it. Um, so most of the time, uh, if you're using this in one of your applications, you're going to have some user interface where people are putting in addresses or otherwise choosing pre-known pre coordinates, and you have to craft this API call. And this is a way to sort of uh, tinker with all the different API parameters. So I could change this to an electric vehicle, for example. And this will give me back um, you know, basically the charge of my battery. Um, I can choose different electric vehicle presets. Um, I can also choose to, let's see if there's some other parameters in here. So I can do vehicle size parameters. So I can set the height of my vehicle. I can set the width of my vehicle. Um, and it'll take all these things into account when it's doing its routing. So very complex API with a lot of parameters. Um, but this gives you a user interface to kind of tinker with them without having to like go through and read every piece of documentation and then just start trying them out in your code. Um, so this is a great way to get started quickly. And if you click on... This index, you'll see we have playgrounds for our geocoding API, which is what does the address search. And then I told you I would come back to isochrones, which are really fun. Um, and isochrones are basically uh, a visual, a polygon, or a, uh, I guess spatial representation of how far you can get from a point in a certain amount of time. Um, so this is very useful behind the scenes uh, for doing simple queries based on distance. So if you can imagine getting back this isochrone and then running a spatial query against it in your database, this is how they can say, you know, this is how you can have a user interface that will say, uh, I want to go to a coffee shop and I want a coffee shop that's within uh, 20 minutes drive. Uh, you know, this is basically the area. So a lot of times you don't see the isochrone, but behind the scenes, the isochrone is at work um, determining a, a given area based on distance from a point, And then that is used to filter other data. Uh, OK, so cover the examples. I cover the playgrounds. Um, now I'll go back to the help docs, which I told you about earlier. Um, so if you click on tutorials, uh, this is just another type of content. So they, you know, the index looks very similar to examples, but um, you know, a lot of these are are kind of just step by step tutorials. So we try and uh, and create them to you know across the full product suite. Um, but basically, you know, you click on one of these. Let's see, style a single country. Um, so this will give you kind of step by step instructions for using our uh, our. Mapbox Studio online styling tool um, to do kind of common use cases. So, you know, step-by-step -step guides, lots of images, lots of, uh, you know, kind of numbered lists to, to help you follow along. Um, but all these are available as well. So um, in the context of onboarding, I would say, you know, most of, uh, most of this is all geared at self-service, right? So uh, to get started, all you need is an API key. And once you register, which just takes a, a simple form submission, um, when you actually go to your account, uh, let's see. Uh, the very first thing you'll see, because that's the thing people need most often, is their is their access token. So that's front and center, and you can just copy it and get moving with your code. Um, and then here we have nice metrics for how much you've used. So we have a very generous free tier um, that will help you, you know, keep track of uh, of when you're going to pass that threshold. Um, 
yeah, so onboarding works pretty well in that regard. Uh, let's see what else I have here in my presentation. Ah, yes, I should show the Discord. Uh, I'll just show a screenshot of it. Um, but yeah, so we started a Mapbox developer Discord back in December. This has been wildly successful, has over 7,000 users in it, and they've all joined since December. So we have been experiencing kind of linear growth um, in the Discord server. Uh, the idea is that we start this community space. So there are uh, myself uh, and several other Mapboxers kind of always lurking in there. We try our best to address questions, but we can't get to every single one. Um, it's not our, it's not an official support channel, so it's more of a community space, but um, we've heard, you know, really great feedback about people being able to get help and also just find peers. There's also like a jobs listing here. So there's a whole, a whole, um, whole page just for uh, people who are looking for work and uh, who have work to offer. So it's really fascinating to see what kind of things people are, uh, are posting in there. Um, and yeah, so how do we manage our developer portal? Um, so uh, from a technical standpoint, it's actually a homegrown static site generator. So if you're familiar with Gatsby or Docusaurus, it uses a lot of the same technologies. Um, React components that are uh, mostly Markdown, but you, the ability to inject React components into Markdown. So you can have you know, really rich uh, custom built tables and things like that that are generated from code uh, and, and it all kind of plays well uh, as a React site. Um, all the contributions are GitHub pull requests, so it's really easy for anyone who has the will um, to run, you know, to clone one of these sites uh, internally at Mapbox, bring it down locally to their machine and start making changes, and they can just pull request those changes. So uh, plenty of people who can just, you know, who are not necessarily full on like front end developers, but are, you know, know enough of the Git workflow to be able to make contributions, and that's great. Um, we also have a lot of automations in place, including, uh, so not just code quality for the developer side uh, internally, but also grammar and spelling checks. So if you're not familiar with the Remark universe, it's basically a lot of, uh, a lot of JavaScript packages that do um, spell checking and checking for bad words and checking for um, certain types of phrases and that sort of thing. So uh, a lot of people will be like first time contributors to the docs and be shocked that the, 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 the bots have rejected a lot of their language. Uh, and that's fine, but it, it helps to you know keep the language uh, consistent throughout uh, what is basically like three or four thousand. I think it's like yeah between two and two thousand and twenty five hundred different pages of content that we have on this doc system. Uh, we also have shared React component libraries. Um, the overall platform is owned by Developer Relations, which is the team I lead. Uh, and then we also we have lots of content contributions from all the disparate product teams at Mapbox. So. Um, you'll find us uh, proofreading and um, kind of vetting content before it makes it in. Um, but usually if there's like a new product launch or if there's like a big initiative to upgrade something, uh, the changes of the actual content come from the developer, from the, uh, the product teams. Um, and then we get UI and UX support from the web team, which has uh, developers and they, they work closely with us uh, on the marketing team at Mapbox. Um, I think there was supposed to be a bullet here, but it's gone. Uh, I wanted to... Uh, sing the praises of this feature because we just launched it a couple days ago. So we actually always had feedback, but I think the form was a little clunkier before. Um, so I borrowed this from a popular developer portal, um, but I love the language on it because it's just a much simpler prompt. Was this page helpful? Yes or no? And you can click yes or no. Um, one of the things I didn't like about the way it was implemented before was that it required you to type a response, which I think would turn a lot of people off because they don't feel like using the mental energy to actually write. Um, and you know this just gives you four options, or you can click another reason, uh, you know, and then you actually have to write something. But if you just click the uh, the first four, the you know text is optional. Um, so this was deployed, uh, I think, literally Monday night, and we got like I think 15 or 20 responses in the first 24 hours, which is more than we get in several weeks before. So that's been really exciting, um, and this will help drive our metrics moving forward. Um, so crucial metrics we look at: uh, we get about 1.3 million page views per month on this site. Um, so we're trying to keep that consistent, but also kind of keep it moving in the upward direction is something I keep uh, track of month to month um, and trying to figure out specifically what areas of the content are, uh, are causing fewer page views or uh, are causing more people to bounce. Uh, that's something we look at quite a bit in the just using Google Analytics. Um, we look at new users versus returning users. We're trying to see, you know, who is who is showing up uh, to read the docs, uh, you know, as a newbie or as somebody who's been using the platform for a while. Um, time spent on page and bounce rates, we've seen a lot of that change You know, when we refactor the content on certain pages. So that's something we keep an eye on. But again, with, with over 2,000 pages, there's you know quite a lot of, each time you want to jump in here and, and study something, it can be a whole case study. Um, 
So take some time and, and take some diligence to figure out what to study. Um, and then key events we, we also look at. Um, so when people hit the copy buttons on the code, when people provide feedback, et cetera. Um, and then the last question, how does our developer portal lead the way in boosting developer experience? Um, so like I said, plentiful and diverse code examples. You know, actually I forgot to show, I'm gonna show what, real quick before we leave, um, just cause I don't wanna leave the mobile people behind. But um, so I showed the examples that we have on the web for web developers, but uh, for the mobile developers, we have full on example apps that you can just run quickly in your uh, local development environment. So for example, this is the iOS app. So I can look at, let's see, polygon annotation. Um, so this is showing me how to add a very simple four-sided polygon onto the map, um, but I can run this very quickly and get started. So it's a little higher learning curve than on the website, but um, we try and <clears throat> do the same uh, for mobile developers. Uh, let's look at another one like markers, because that's the one I was showing earlier. So literally the exact same example with the exact same markers in the same place. So we try and get consistency as much as we can across web and mobile, because a lot of times uh, companies are building literally the exact same map experience, but they want one to be native and they want one to be accessible on the web. Um, so that's our developer side. And let's see, yeah, our Discord server, our API playgrounds, and pretty much everything you need, uh, everything needed to inspire and equip developers working with our tools. And I think that'll end it for me, but thank you for your time and I would love to answer your questions. Thank you. Uh, I hope you can hear the clapping. <laughs> Very impressive presentation. One uh, question from Brian so far. How does Mapbox turn users from free users into paid users? Do you have any tips or tricks uh, how to do this conversion? Uh, that I don't know. I don't know if I have a poignant answer on that, but I think it just it comes with time. I think we you know we we start with a very delightful experience and a very generous free tier. So most of the time, if you're a hobby developer or you're just trying to test it out, like 50,000 map views in a month is, is, a, is a pretty generous offering and you're not going to meet that. Um, but once you start using it in production, it's very cut and dry, you know, what your costs will be. Um, so we have a very detailed pricing page that you can kind of explore all these different scenarios. Um, so I wouldn't say, yeah, I don't know if I have a, a good answer on how that, because um, because generally like we have a whole sales team and, and a whole, you know, uh, support team that works with our higher, our, our higher tier enterprise paying customers. And that's all, those are all negotiated, um, negotiated contracts. Um, so the middle tier of like, of you know, there's a long tail of free users who never pass the free tier. And then there's a, a, a lot of people who are kind of in, the, in that in-between area. Um, so I think it's more just, uh, you know, delight them and, and give them uh, all the tools they need. And then eventually, you know, these things will just continue to get used in, in, um, in production in whatever place they work and whatever try they're trying to solve. So I think it's just a natural evolution. And it's such an interesting tool because I feel like it's something that anybody who's a developer would love to play around with regardless, right? So you just have like such a cool leg up there and then having that generous free tier, I think, you know, helps a lot. You, you know, you showed all those metrics that you guys are gathering. Is there anything like from the dev portal documentation side that you're then like, are you feeding those metrics back to sales? Like to say, you know, oh, here are some users who are close, you know, is there any interaction there or are those two worlds disparate? Uh, I would say um, that's something I'm, I'm trying to bridge that gap a little bit more. I've been here for about a year and a half and I, I, um, I actually didn't have, uh, a, you know, I, the docs weren't on my plate until I guess earlier, like end of December, like end of last year. So been about nine months since I've been steering the ship and, uh, the like the feedback example I showed you is me trying to like get a handle on what people are actually doing on this site. So uh, you know it's it's all baby steps. So um, so I would say no, there's not a lot of uh, direct feedback back to sales. But like you know when people leave feedback, we do you know we we can know who was logged in at what particular time and and would love to be able to follow up when especially when there's really important um, you know important and and um, key feedback that we need to follow up on, I would love to do that. But um, again, you know, baby steps. A quick tooling question connected. Uh, what do you use to track metrics? And could you just elaborate on that phrase checking tool that you mentioned that you know, I think you were talking about Java in the meantime? Oh, okay. So the phrase checking is called Remark. So Remark is a whole suite of JavaScript applications, or sorry, JavaScript libraries that uh, are all about text processing. Um, so you should have, you should have no trouble finding that if you Google, um, it's just R E M A R K. Um, so we extend that. So we have our own like custom language library, uh, of acceptable terms and things that should cause flags. You can also set it to be a warning or an error. So 
errors will actually stop the bills and warnings are just kind of like let the developers know that something was flagged, but it's not a showstopper. Um, so lots of flexibility, you can do that. Mm -hmm. um, how do you identify what the right examples to build are? So this has been actually a lot of fun. So I, I think I mentioned in my initial slide, but I've been a Mapbox developer for like almost a decade now, I guess, since the company started, because um, it, it hasn't been around for that long. So it's only, I think it's 12 years old. And um, anyway, I've been building web maps for most of my career, uh, in this stage of my career anyway. And it, it meant a lot to me to, to start working on the docs because these examples have been not only useful to me, but I also teach web mapping. And that's exactly how I teach it is to show people examples and push them right into the deep end and say, here's, here's your map, you know, the world is yours, you can customize it and add interactions and things like that. Um, it comes up quite a bit, like we, it, it, it's, you know, we don't have, uh, we don't have like a, a matrix of every single theme or concept, but like, it's all kind of based on your exposure to the community. So that's why we set up the Discord server is because we can hear direct feedback about what people want. And most of the time, like I gauge this very easily is when I go into Discord, if I don't have a, you know, if somebody asks a question and I don't already have a ready to go resource for it, a glossary entry, a tutorial, or an example to show them, then that's a red flag for me. And I will immediately, before I even answer the question, I will go run over and write it down in like a Google doc and say, people are asking about this and we don't have a good example for it. Now, not every single one of those flags ever, you know, makes it into an example, but if we hear it enough, uh, you know, eventually there gets to be enough inertia that we say, okay, now it's time to sit down and figure out who's going to build this and, uh, what should it do and that sort of thing. So I've contributed probably five or six of these over the last year uh, of my own just for the website. Um, and actually that becomes problematic too, because you really should be doing it across all three, you know, mobile, you know, iOS, Android and web. And like, I can't do the, personally, I can't build the, the web, the iOS and Android side uh, example. So I need to find like a content partner. Um, so again, there's another challenge we have, but I think it all comes from user feedback. Was it always the DevRel team that owned the portal? Uh, there was no DevRel team before 2022. Uh -huh. um, so uh, there was a, you know, historically there was a, there was a full documentation engineering team. Um, so that included content people, uh, front end developers, uh, product people. Um, so I'm, I'm slowly rebuilding that right now and trying to, uh, like I'm hiring a, I have a front end engineer starting next week and uh, my next hire, if I could pick one immediately, which I, you know, hasn't been granted to me yet, but if I could, uh, it would be a, a content person. So mm -hmm. that would be either a technical writer or um, content strategist who's also you know, spending a lot of time writing. Um, but yeah, developer relations as a practice, I think uh, yeah, I think the company used to be a lot, you know, when it was much smaller, I think there was a lot more kind of everyone's a developer attitude so that there was a much more of a, everybody's doing developer relations. So now that we've grown, I think it's, it, it's become a more specialized thing and um, and yeah, that this is my my practice to grow here and um, trying to trying to grow that and kind of get the right people on the team that can uh, kind of continue that uh, that mission. Mm -hmm. So matching these timelines, that means that the Discord uh, server was also an initiative from the DevRel team. Now, was there uh, internal politics, be that about money, uh, legal or uh, power or any of that? And what about the moderation? And does this happen on your Sunday nights or how do you do this? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, so I would say, uh, no, there was not a lot of turmoil. I think uh, there was some general aversion of just kind of worried about new things that you get from anybody who is in a position of authority who, you know, has to bless off on something. But, um, you know, over time, I mean, the, the kind of the whole point was this is this is like this is a, a, a continuation of our self-service uh, uh ethos here is that like, you know, we obviously it costs, it costs a lot of, uh, of, of person hours to, to do direct support for people. And we want to give people uh, an environment where they can get their questions answered, but not necessarily with a direct burden on Mapbox, uh, you know, staff, right? So Discord is a great, like, that's, that's a very simple, like, uh, proposition to say, like, form this community, and let's just kind of see where we can get it to go and set up uh, channels when people request channels. So, um, you know, over time, people, you know, enough people get together and say, we want to, we want a channel for Flutter, or we want a ch channel for some other framework, and we try and grant that. Um, I probably spend, you know, 30 minutes to an hour per day in there. Uh, I, I like to start my day and see if I can answer some questions in there, but sometimes I just can't get to it. 
so you're right. Moderation is hard, and I think that's something that um, you know. Again, if I can, if I can grow my team and have some like junior people who could spend a lot more time in there, like making sure everybody's on topic, that would be great. But for the most part, it's just we have one like general channel that's just full of clutter, and then the um, the topic channels are much more organized. So I think people expect that already at the general channel, and if they're you know if they're really like planning to stick around and and you know be part of the community, they will kind of tune that out and just move to one of the product channels and actually, you know, meet people that they're um, more more aligned with and what they're building. Mm -hmm. And if the help doesn't happen on Discord, uh, how do you help the developers if they get uh, stuck in the onboarding, like if a code sample doesn't work for them? Um, I mean, so that's it. We can't get to everybody. And I think there are, you know, we run the full gamut, right? There, there are Fortune 500 companies where people drop into Discord with questions and then they're just like hobbyists and tinkerers. Um, so I, I don't have a good answer for how. I mean, uh, you know, either the questions don't get answered or maybe people graduate to paid support, which we actually offer as well. Um, but yeah, the, the only like formal response you'll get from Mapbox is when, if you, you're in a, for, in a uh, support tier, like a paid support tier. Um, but yeah, we just we try and do our best, right? So we let people know, be a squeaky wheel, uh, ask in the right channel, um, form your question well. So I, I'm, I'm, you'll see me in there constantly responding to people saying, you need to post a screenshot, you need to post some code, your your question's not formed enough to get a response. Mm -hmm. um, and I think also just if you if you spend enough time in there, you'll, um, I think you'll get like a lot of people are just kind of drive by and uh, ask a very a very open ended, not very well formed question and don't get a response, and they might get frustrated. Um, so I think you have to coach them a little bit to be like, hey, if you want to, if you if you want to be taken seriously here, like you need to, you know, show us that you've put in at least some of the homework. What docs have you read? What have you tried? Show us your code. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, if you are allowed to say, are you planning on joining the AI hype? Um, I did. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, okay. Come back to you on that one. All right. Let's hear next year. Actually, I'm sorry. Did you say AI hype? Yes. Yes. Are you planning okay. a thing about there? I thought you were talking about something else. So up on our website right now on our blog, you'll see a blog post for a new product called Map GPT, which is what it sounds like, um, but basically a live, you know, interactive uh, chat experience with a, think of it as kind of like, um, you know, Alexa in your car type of thing. Uh, so you can yeah. talk to the map and it will go search for things for you and say, hey, I'm driving, you know, I'm, I'm trying to take a shortcut through downtown. What, you know, where can I, uh, where can I stop to get coffee? And it will kind of curate that uh, navigation experience for you. So go check that mm -hmm. out on Mapbox.com. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Cool. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation um, okay. and congratulations. Um, and